I'm Barbara Lau. I'm the executive director of the Pauli Murray Center for History and Social Justice. I use she, her, her pronouns. And today I'm speaking to you from Durham, North Carolina, which is the ancestral home of the Eno, the Shikori, and the Tuscarora people. Today I'm gonna to talk about why historic places and stories are so important in Durham and why sometimes we don't hear about some of them because of systemic racism, homophobia, and sexism. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about the West End neighborhood and the Pauli Murray legacy. So I came here about 30 years ago. I was advancing my career as a public folklorist by coming to graduate school. Public folklorists care about expressive culture, the things that make us who we are, the places we care about, recipes, songs, stories. And one of the things I learned as a public folklorist is that if I really wanted to understand those things about another community, about someone else, I couldn't just look at them from my point of view. I needed to understand their meaning by talking to and learning from other people by understanding what was important to them, by how they gave people, places, stories, and songs meaning. And when I took my first job at Duke, I inherited a great project called Community Stories. And through that project, we taught high school and middle school students how to use the tools of oral history to collect the stories of their neighborhoods. And that is what helped me learn more about the West End. Now the West End is kind of between where I am now on Duke's West Campus and downtown Durham. It's a historically African-American working class neighborhood. And I was incredibly lucky to get to know some of the folks who had grown up there. People like Miss Elliot, who shared the photos with me that she took with her brand new brownie camera in the 1960s. People like Mr. Thomas, who told me about what it was like to play baseball in Lyon Park, about the Negro Leagues, about what it was like to return to Durham after the Second World War, fighting, having fought for freedom, but being discriminated against because of his race. I was able to learn from Miss Willie Mae Webb and her daughter, Mamie, about the Rose Club about the golf club, about all of the different social events that happened in Lyon Park, about their neighborhood elementary school and its famous safety patrol. Ms. Walker taught me a little bit about some of the other luminaries that had grown up in the neighborhood, the judges, the business owners, the musicians, the artists. And Ms. Etta McKee was the first person who suggested that I should learn something about Pauli Murray. Now, of course, before I came here, I didn't know who Pauli Murray was, but I fast grew to understand that people in the West End thought that Pauli Murray was one of the most important people who had grown up there. The first time I saw Pauli Murray's childhood home, I wasn't very impressed. I could have driven by it. It would have been simple. It, its chimneys were crumbling. Its roof was sagging. It was clear that it was going to need a lot of TLC if it was ever going to be a historic space that people could visit. But it wasn't what I thought that mattered. It was what people in the neighborhood thought. And they understood that this house was where Robert George Fitzgerald and his wife Cornelia had raised their family. Now Robert was a Union Army uh, soldier and also served in the Union Navy. And he raised his family here and in fact convinced his brothers and sisters and parents to move here from Delaware. His brother, Richard Fitzgerald, became one of the richest men in North Carolina by the 20th, turn of the 20th century. And so this place had meaning for the neighborhood. Now, we were trying to think about how to honor that and how to think about the legacy of Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray was a brilliant student and an original thinker. Uh, she was somebody who tried to desegregate the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1938. She sat down on a bus in Petersburg, Virginia in 1940, 15 years before Rosa Parks did that in Montgomery. She was somebody who was always ahead of their time. 
In fact, they sought hormone treatment in the 1930s and 40s because they felt like maybe they were a man in a woman's body. They went on to uh, go to law school and become a civil rights attorney. They coined the term Jane Crow to begin to, to describe how they had been experiencing discrimination, not just because of their race, but also because of their gender. Way before we started including intersectionality in our academic lexicon, they helped to found the National Organization for Women, and they did the legal research that produced the memo arguing for the inclusion of sex in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Now, that was important then, but it continues to be important. It was what Ruth Bader Ginsburg used to fight her cases in the Supreme Court for the rights of women. And it's what the ACLU recently used to fight their cases in the Supreme Court for LGBTQ rights. While Polly was at uh, Howard Law School, they wrote a paper about why they thought we needed to use a different strategy to fight against school segregation. And in fact, they built this idea about how schools that were segregated were inherently unequal. And so their people in their law school thought this was, you know, kind of funny. They, they just would, didn't believe that this was a workable strategy. And yet, this was the strategy that won the famous Brown v. Board case. And in fact, Pauli Murray's paper was in the room when the lawyers were working out how they were going to approach this. So while Pauli wasn't there, Pauli was there in, in ideas. Pauli, in 1977, became the first African-American woman to be ordained as an Episcopal priest. So quite an amazing story quite a big story, but it didn't stop in Polly Murray's lifetime. In fact, Polly worked to pass on the baton, this baton for human rights and civil rights. And while they were at Yale getting their JSD degree, their third law degree, they were able to mentor some of the students that were there. So Marion Wright Edelman, who went on to found the Children's Defense Fund, and even more recently, Reverend Kim Jackson, an Episcopal priest from Georgia who's the first out member of the Georgia legislature. More locally, Dolores Chandler, a writer, a social worker, an equity trainer. All these people are working to carry on the legacy of Pauli Murray. But you might ask, why haven't we heard of Pauli Murray? So many people ask me that. Well, I would argue, it's because the stories of black people, the stories of women, the stories of queer people, they don't get the same attention. In fact, when we look at historic sites on the National Register, of the 95,000 sites, only 2% focus on the stories of African Americans. The, the numbers aren't very much better for women and they're even worse for LGBTQ people. So, us learning more about Pauli Murray's childhood home and understanding the importance of these stories led us to renovate that childhood home, which was built in 1898. This grew from the work uh, of the Pauli Murray Center for History and Social Justice, which had its roots at the Duke Human Rights Center and the Franklin Humanities Institute. And we started this work in 2012 and in 2015, the rest of the world caught up with us. Uh, the house was named a national treasure in 2015 by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And in 2016, it became a national historic landmark. There are only about 2,500 of those in the United States. We're the 39th in North Carolina. The first one in North Carolina focused on the stories of women and the first one in the nation focused on a person of color who is LGBTQ. So we hope not to be the first and the onlys for very long. We hope that there will be many more to follow us. And we think it's really important that these stories get told, that we share the importance of the ways that people have contributed, not just to civil and human rights work, but across the board in all fields and endeavors. Now, Paul and Murray's call to us is complicated. 
it's not just uh, wanting to have all of their accomplishments, all of their struggles, all of their poetry. It's such a big story, it's, we don't even have time to tell it all. But telling it and knowing it are not enough. It's important that we keep this work going, that we think about this vision that Pauli Murray was creating of a world in which people like them could show up, be counted, and matter, where dignity and value were afforded to everyone. So Pauli Murray invites us to acknowledge the damage of the past, the damage that racism, sexism, and homophobia have had on our communities, and to think about how we move forward, how we begin to repair that, that damage and move forward to heal the world that we all want to live in, the world in which all of the Pauli Murrays are accepted and valued, the world that I want to live in, the world I hope you want to live in as well. Thank you.